C'est pour moi un grand honneur qu'on m'a fait de demander de présenter M. Dick Pound, l'un des plus célèbres Canadiens sur la scène sportive internationale, à titre de conférencier invité à cette conférence Mannion 2016. Um, I know that we're looking forward to hearing from your insights and experiences uh, shortly. I have a really cool job because I get to meet very interesting and important people and I will make a small connection, Mr. Pound, uh, through Montreal because I was born in Montreal and it's the first uh, community in which I lived. I got to meet another great Montrealer who's had a huge impact on the world last uh, Wednesday and that's of course the incomparable Bill Shatner at uh, the Star Trek. <laughs> Montreal is obviously an incubator of great Canadians and uh, <laughs> with global impact, and uh, I'm humbled to, be, uh, to have had a chance to meet both of you. So um, before telling you a little bit more about, uh, about Mr. Pound, uh, I just want to acknowledge the great work of the Canada School um, uh, or, and all of the things that it does. Le Domon Rapport Annuel, publié récemment, est l'intention du Premier ministre, and I know you've all read your, your copies. En vue de réaliser le programme du gouvernement, et de répondre aux attentes croissantes des Canadiens, j'ai indiqué que la fonction publique se devait d'accélérer le rythme de modernisation et de renouvellement. Le monde qui entoure change constamment. Et comme la société évolue, la fonction publique doit évoluer, évoluer avec elle. Canada School of Public Service provides public servants across the country from coast to coast to coast with exceptional opportunities to strengthen their skills and competencies that they require to excel in our rapidly evolving environment. And I want to thank Wilma and her team and her staff and the leadership of the school for the contribution they continue to make to public service. Round of applause for the school, please. <laughs> Special events like today's Mannion Lecture play a key role in provoking thoughtful discussion, generating ideas, new ways of thinking, new ways of seeing our world, new ways of doing our jobs as public servants. Ideas are critical, but we also have to create the culture in which ideas are welcomed, take root, and flourish. We have to build a public service where engagement with each other, with stakeholders, partners, is the norm, not the exception. We have to build a public service that breaks down turf and territory and silos, Collaboration is an instinct, the first response, where smart, intelligent risk-taking is the norm, is encouraged. And of course, a public service based on respect, openness, and transparency. A public service that sees renewal as its continuing mission and a continuous exercise of self-reflection and improvement. And a public service where all public servants are delivering real results for Canadians results that can be measured and that make a difference in the lives of Canadians and people around the world. Donc, Objectif 2020 nous a, en apprend beaucoup sur ce que nous devons faire pour bâtir la fonction publique que nous désirons tous. We have to pick up the pace of modernization initiatives in order to have the right tools, lighter structures, lighter processes, and at the same time, we have to uh, redouble our focus on being the workplace and the work for, uh, workforce that we need to be. The strong focus that I've inherited from my predecessors and will continue on workplace well-being and mental health in particular, so that every public servant is able to give his or her best. Leaders in the public service have an obligation to create that work environment, an environment of respect, an environment that embraces differences and diversity, an environment of compassion for individuals struggling with health issues. So this year, uh, we will be uh, expecting all heads of agencies and departments to really focus on health and well-being. Workplace well-being is the corporate commitment in performance uh, agreements of deputy heads, and you will be engaging with them in the weeks and months ahead on what's appropriate in your institution uh, to move forward in this important challenge. In this context, how we manage ethical challenges and complexities is also a key mark of effective leadership. As I've often said, one of the things that must not change in the public service is our grounding in our values and indeed in our ethics. The values are the foundation of what we do for this country and they give us a touchstone for where we want to go in the future. We must remain professional, 
nonpartisan. Public service values, respect for democracy, respect for people, integrity, stewardship, excellence, continue to guide everything that we do. Which brings me to my main purpose, which is to introduce one of Canada's foremost figures. Dick Pound's contribution in competitive and high profile world of international sport is there for you on Google. Um, I won't try to repeat it all, but it's an impressive and varied career. Competitive swimmer, medalist, Olympian, tax lawyer, chancellor of uh, a university, somebody who has authored books, somebody who sat on the executive of an international organization for, for 16 years, I believe, made enormous contributions within Canada to the sports and Olympic movement and of course across the world. Native of St. Catharines, but somebody firmly rooted in Montreal, Dick Pound's involvement in Olympic sports started at a very young age as a competitor, a double finalist in the 1960 games in Rome. How many of you were alive in 1960? <laughs> Went on to win gold. <laughs> Gold, silvers, and a bronze medal for Canada at the Commonwealth Games in Australia. While a student, Dick was in, invited to take a position as Secretary of the Canadian Olympic Committee and continued to work and um, thrive in that organization and then eventually became its president. In 1987, he took over the role of Vice President of the International Olympic Committee and spent more than 16 years on the IOC's Executive Committee, seeing it through some very challenging and turbulent times. Dick built the Olympics into a multi-billion dollar enterprise, branding and marketing the Olympic rings, negotiating television and sponsorship agreements, and is still involved in Olympic broadcasting issues. Very uh, concerned and engaged in the issues of ethics in sport, Dick founded the World Anti-Doping Agency to coordinate the fight against doping in sport. And within five years, the agency's code had been adopted by all of the Olympic disciplines testament to his sense of fair play and his tenacity in organizing skills. The issue of doping in sports continues to challenge us, and you can also go to Google and see how topical it is today in terms of the track and field and other sports um, that are, it's an ongoing challenge. So um, with that very, very thin introduction uh, to a remarkable career, which again is far from over, and I know we will continue to hear from Dick Pound, his contributions to Canada and the world, let me ask you to join me in giving a strong public service welcome and Ottawa welcome to a great Canadian, Dick Pound. Thank you very much for that splendid uh, introduction. It, it compares um, uh, remarkably with uh, one that was uh, uh, afforded to uh, our national basketball coach, uh, Jack Donahue, a number of years ago. He was at a conference, a uh, great public speaker. And they said to him uh, as he was coming up onto the stage, uh, uh, Jack, we're running a little behind. Would you mind introducing yourself? <laughs> yeah, okay. So he, he said, uh, hello, my name is Jack Donahue. I'm Canada's national basketball uh, team coach. Uh, I'm 61 years old, I'm married, I have five children, and I sleep in the nude. <laughs> Which he said is, is usually only a problem on long flights. <laughs> I'm re I must say, I'm really delighted uh, to be here. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a tremendous audience, and uh, I'm very conscious of the, the honor attached to the invitation to deliver the Mannion Lecture, and that I am speaking to current and future leaders of the public service in Canada. I also appreciate the uh, continuity of the connection with uh, representatives of the uh, Mannion family, particularly you, uh, great-grandmother Mannion. Uh, my chief worry is that you may conclude that there's a downward slide in the quality of uh, people speaking uh, on this occasion. As in many uh, aspects of leadership in today's complex world, 
there is uh, ongoing concern about the standards of that leadership and the responsibilities inherent in the exercise of the considerable powers that have been or will be conferred upon you as public servants. These powers will enable you and may require you to make decisions, often discretionary decisions, which can have profound impacts on the lives of those affected by them. For your own part, you will want to make the right decisions, correct in matters of law, and reasonable in relation to the facts before you when decisions are made. You will also exert, as a matter of fact, a considerable influence on the development and application of legislative policies, helping those in political power to avoid mistakes and bringing to their attention gaps and shortfalls based on your understanding of, of the machinery of administration of the government with which the legislators may be unfamiliar. And of course, ensuring that legislation and the administration of it do not breach the provisions of our charter. The real value, the real measure rather, of the values of any society are reflected in the manner in which public servants carry out their duties and in the degree of confidence their conduct engenders in that society. Reasonable people are fully aware that they will not always achieve the results they are seeking. What they need to be able to conclude, however, is that their concerns have been addressed in an even-handed and impartial manner and to be satisfied that they've had every chance to make their representations to someone who has considered those representations prior to making a decision. In the field with which I'm uh, the most familiar, uh, namely taxation, quite often much of the process borders on primal scream therapy, <laughs> where the final outcome is often less important to a taxpayer than the knowledge that someone independent has listened to whatever it is that the taxpayer felt it necessary to say. You are a combination of the current and future leaders of the Canadian public service. As such, you are required to take on many serious legal, policy, administrative, and moral responsibilities. How do you approach the issues of leadership attaching to your positions? Uh, that's what I'm supposed to address. <laughs> and I propose to, to experiment this afternoon with a somewhat different uh, approach to the discussion, so as my skiing friends would say, uh, or pissed, which I hope may prove to be of some value as you go forward. Now, over the years, I have collected a number of observations on leadership and the moral content of leadership, and I'll try to share some of those uh, with you. Starting with leadership uh, itself, uh, the concise Oxford Dictionary defines lead as to cause a person or animal to go with one by drawing them along. And leader as the person who leads, commands, or precedes a group, organization, or country. And in that respect, it, perhaps it might be useful to examine some observations on the question of leadership coming from great leaders and scholars. And I have a few examples for you. Starting with concepts, Peter Drucker concludes, management is doing things right. Leadership is doing the right things. Warren Bennis, in his book entitled, Why Leaders Can't Lead, a little ominous if you're buying it, said very much along the same lines, leaders are people who do the right thing, managers are people who do things right. Both roles are crucial but they differ profoundly. I often observe people in top positions, he says, doing the wrong thing well. <laughs> Norman Bethune, another great Canadian, uh, in identifying the personal element of leadership, said, every leader starts by first leading himself. 
Then we have a somewhat muscular, uh, even steroidal uh, approach by Paul Keating, who maintains that leadership is not about being nice. It's about being right and being strong. Hmm. Woodrow Wilson uh, concluded, based on his academic and political experience, that absolute identity with one's cause is the first and great condition of successful leadership. Clark Crouch said, and this is, I must say is one of my favorites, that leadership is getting the right people to do the right thing for the right reason, in the right way, at the right time, at the right use of resources. Now there are some cynical and, and occasionally humorous views on leadership, which nevertheless uh, contain occasional grains of truth, uh, which help test the, the more serious uh, observations. So we have Clifford Hanley uh, in a book of Squ uh, Scottish quotations who says that a born leader of men is someone who's afraid to go anywhere by himself. <laughs> Tom Wolfe observes, it is very comforting to believe that leaders who do terrible things are in fact mad. That way, all we have to do is make sure we don't put psychotics in high places and we've got the problem solved. <laughs> Adlai Stevenson concluded, uh, it's hard to lead a cavalry charge if you think you look funny on a horse. <laughs> Ellis Marsalis has this advice, never follow anybody who's working less than you. Thomas Henry Huxley says that those who profess to lead are simply the fastest runners and the loudest squeakers of the herd which is rushing blindly down to its destruction. <laughs> and finally, Publilius Cyrus, always uh, in my view a, a very realistic uh, observer of the human condition, states, anyone can hold the helm when the sea is calm. Now, all of these observations are useful for the purposes of triangulating the elements of leadership, um, the elements uh, of which I submit include the following. First, that, that leadership requires a vision of what the organization should be or become. It is implicit in this concept of vision that there is always a gap between what the organization is to date and what it can become and that there is a potential that remains unfulfilled. I sat for a number of years on the board of a public uh, company, this is some time ago, when one of my fellow directors asked the chief executive officer of the company what was his vision for the company. And the CEO pulled out the corporate mission statement and began to read from it. The director interrupted him and said he had not asked him to describe the corporate mission, but instead his vision of what the company should be, where he wanted to, to take it. And the director uh, illustrated the point rather amusingly by saying that, that Christ had a vision and sent out missionaries. He did not have a mission and send out visionaries. I would certainly never suggest that uh, by any means that leadership uh, is a solitary exercise, uh, far from it. Uh, leadership should involve at least as much listening as it does speaking. No one has a monopoly on good ideas and good leadership includes the willingness to accept fine ideas from any source, whether inside or outside the organization and, of course, the ability to separate the good from the bad. Leadership requires the ability to establish certain objectives that the leader has identified and is able to articulate. It also requires that these objectives be organized into a plan and be packaged in such a manner that they are achievable by the organization. The leader must always be aware of what is possible 
and perhaps more important, what is not achievable. This may mean that the leader has to be prepared to parse his or her uh, objectives or a series of objectives without abandoning, abandoning the ultimate objective in any way and not attempt to go too far too fast. May also mean that the leader does not necessarily disclose the full plan sooner than the organization is able to absorb it. On that point, some of you who've been around uh, for a while may recall the criticism of the charter when it was first adopted, uh, but only uh, with the notwithstanding clause included. And the Prime Minister of the day, Pierre Elliott uh, Trudeau, responded in typical fashion, and those of you who knew him will, will recognize uh, his uh, approach to this, by saying, would you rather have no charter at all or one with a notwithstanding clause? End of discussion. And he knew perfectly well uh, the political risks of trying to go too far too fast. The next skill is to be able to communicate the plan within the organization and to generate buy-in at all levels. Without buy-in of this nature, it is unlikely that the plan, however good it might be, will be properly executed. Only when the management team and employees are committed to the plan will they exert their best efforts to make sure that it is achieved. In most cases, and you will certainly encounter this in the public service, there will also be a need to have external buy-in to the plan, which will, of course, vary in, in accordance uh, with the publics affected by it, but whose support, whether tacit or overt, is essential to the success of the organization. Now, it may be a, a, a voting public, it may be an investing public, uh, an elimocenary public, uh, a consuming public, or, or an entertaining seeking public. But whatever that public may be, the leader must be able to generate the necessary support. The plan in place and the buy-in generated, the leader must then enable the management and employees to act. Must rigorously avoid any impulse to micromanage the activities. And as those of you who know, the more you understand what needs to be done, the more certain it is that that temptation will arise. So the leader's job is to supervise and to be sure that uh, he or she is getting the best from all levels of the organization. If there's a good adage to bear in mind in this context, it would be hands on, fingers out. We've all heard the nightmare stories of the seagull leader who flies in from time to time, uttering shrill cries, depositing excrement everywhere, <laughs> and then flying out again. Or the, there's the Jesus Christ uh, School of Crisis Management, when whenever there's a crisis, the leader shouts, Jesus Christ! These are not the leaders you want to emulate. In some respects, the leader must be something of a cheerleader, dispensing recognition and appreciation for jobs well done and for the successes enjoyed. And it's amazing, and I'm sure you know this from experience, it's amazing how much harder people are willing to work when they know that their efforts are noticed and appreciated by the leadership of the organization. In many respects, job satisfaction is far less about financial consideration than feeling valued for one's contributions to the organization. There's a Chinese proverb which holds that a good leader inspires others with confidence in him, while a great leader inspires them with confidence in themselves. A leader must always be assessing and measuring progress towards the objectives of the organization. And again, this is not necessarily an exercise in detail, but one from the perspective of 10,000 meters. As to measurement of this nature, I must say I've never been in a regulatory situation where I could apply it, but uh, if I were king for a day in the regulatory field, I would make it possible for reporting entities to elect to report on an annual basis rather than quarterly barring, of course, significant changes that might uh, uh, have to uh, be taken into account in risk appreciation. 
but I think it borders on lunacy for organizations to be forced, in effect, to meet quarterly financial and other targets in an enterprise that has medium and long-term objectives. We've all seen some of the resulting excesses and manipulations that have got many organizations and their executives into serious difficulties, and in some cases, even into criminal behavior. Uh, no one is completely clairvoyant, uh, even the best leaders. So events may well and probably will on occasion uh, unfold that will require adaptation to new circumstances and a reworking of uh, strategies and plans. The leader must always be alert to the circumstances that may require change, and the best leaders will be able to see the circumstances in advance and figure out how best to deal with them in real time, not after they may have had a crippling impact on the organization. And it is, as we all know, invariably better to avoid a problem than to have to solve it. This leads to a prescription that every good leader should follow. He or she must leave him or herself enough time to think. Dr. David Schwartz, the author of uh, The Magic of Self-Direction, notes that the successful person in any field takes time out to confer with himself or herself. Real leaders use the solitude to put the pieces of a problem together, to work out solutions, and to plan. You don't have to be an Einstein, and perhaps you may not want to be one, but as leaders, it is certainly worth bearing in mind one of his well-known observations, namely that problems cannot be solved within the framework in which the problems were created. So let's move on a bit now to the more difficult challenge, that of, of examining the, the moral aspects of leadership. Uh, this is not uh, an easy task, as we all know, and anyone who undertakes it must be particularly careful not to fall into the trap of preaching. As Samuel Johnson observed, be not too hasty to trust or to admire teachers of morality. They discourse like angels, but they live like men. Morality can often be an aspect of our lives that we seldom examine very closely. Uh, in his work entitled Everyday Ethics, Joshua Halberstam observed, we spend much more time tending to the quality of our emotional lives than to the quality of our moral lives. Many people are prepared to shake up their lives in a mad bid for emotional happiness, but very few will disturb their moral suppositions. When was the last time you asked yourself hard questions about your values? But once again, uh, we're here to consider moral leadership uh, or values, and I, I take this to be an invitation not to examine morality in the abstract, but rather to reflect on how moral considerations insert themselves into the actions of the best leaders. We are in the final analysis speaking of values, what we are willing to do and what we are not. In some respects, for those of you with uh, marketing experience, it is perhaps easier to understand the issue if you think of a commercial brand or, or the brand of your own organization. And, and as you know, a brand is not just a trade or other mark stamped on a package or a product or description of a service. A brand is a set of expectations and permissions. And it's easily illustrated by a simple example. If I say Lada and Rolls Royce, if I say um, Mont Blanc or Swatch, or I'm sorry, Mont <laughs> Bic and Mont Blanc, excuse me, I'm getting my <laughs> Bic and Mont Blanc, or Swatch and Rolex, I am in each case describing uh, two products that do precisely the same thing provide transportation, allow you to write, or tell the time of day. But I will bet that each of those uh, brands mentioned to you has undoubtedly triggered in your mind completely different sets of expectations and a sense of what is appropriate or not appropriate for the use of each of them. 
not to mention, of course, the amounts he would be willing to pay for them. As, as some of you may know, for many years, I was uh, responsible for negotiating television rights to the Olympic Games and for the development of an international marketing program of the uh, International Olympic Committee. And as part of this exercise, we had to find out what were the core elements, the core values of the Olympic brand in order to know what the world thought of us and expected from us. Uh, for me, it was a, a fascinating and particularly valuable exercise. And we learned, uh, to somewhat to our surprise, that the Olympic brand was remarkably consistent throughout the entire world, east and west, north and south, developed and developing worlds. And interestingly enough, well, elements such as gold medal, uh, Olympic champion, and world record were obviously part of the brand. The core aspects were much more values oriented and expressed in a moral context, such as aspiration, youth, international, peaceful, striving, and respect. And the research we did on, on the, this point enabled us to be sure that we did not stray from these fundamental values in any of our commercial or television arrangements. It also told us to avoid uh, relationships that would uh, damage the brand. So it made it very easy, for example, for us to refuse tobacco sponsorships that were very popular in, in many parts of the world, as you know. Um, and any uh, association with distilled spirits were, you know, as being way off message, not only with the public e expectation of the Olympic brands, but also uh, offside as far as the, the permissions attaching to the brand. So we would not allow our Olympic television sponsors uh, to run any commercials uh, advertising products uh, of that nature. And we had one case in, in Asia. Uh, there was a, an Asian broadcaster which had a tobacco sponsor. We said, you can't run uh, tobacco or cigarette commercials during the games. You can do it any other time you want, but not during the games. And the broadcaster nevertheless insisted, saying that tobacco was not regarded negatively within its broadcast territory, so there would be no adverse public reaction to the commercials. And there we were in something of a standoff until we hit upon a solution. Uh, at the time, and, and still to some degree now, all broadcasters of Olympic television uh, relied upon what was then known as the host broadcaster to provide the basic signal, the basic coverage of all events. Every heat, every quarterfinal, every game, uh, every medal presentation, whatever it may be. As, the, as kind of the stock footage, and then they, they could do their, what they call unilateral coverage, which would be Canada would, would uh, cover events in particular depth uh, where Canadians were participating or, ex or, or expecting to do well. And our solution to this cigarette commercial was really quite simple. As soon as we saw that the broadcaster had run another tobacco commercial, we pulled the plug on their connection with the basic signal. Their network went completely blank, no audio, no video, nothing. They panicked, I mean, it took them about four seconds to call. A call and they say, you know, we, we, there's a huge problem, their network had crashed, uh, what could be done about it? And we said, well, we're very, of course, very sorry to hear that your network has uh, crashed. We, we were wondering if perhaps there might be some electronic allergy to smoke. <laughs> penny dropped, they understood, we plugged them back in, and the problem was solved not only then, but forever in the future. And you get known for what you're prepared to do in, in cases like that to protect your brand. Everybody, every broadcaster in, in, in the world covering the Olympics knew what happened, and they knew why it happened, and they certainly didn't want it to happen to them. So I think you have to identify uh, first, what are your basic principles? And then where you draw the line in the sand. And following that, be certain that you don't compromise those principles. Your responsibility as a leader is to make sure that everyone in your organization understands the principles and that they are fundamental, 
not just because you say they are, but because your conduct makes it clear that this is the case. It's certainly useful for any good leader to ask him or herself if there's a difference between what he or she stands for and what the organization stands for, and perhaps vice versa. But any discrepancy is bound to carry with it the likelihood of a moral failure. A leader should be known for the integrity of the promises made, notwithstanding Sam Goldwyn's uh, well-known statement that a verbal promise is not worth the paper it's written on. A verbal promise is no less binding than a written contract. I had a, uh, an example of that a few years ago in, involving one of our huge television contracts with NBC for the, the US television rights to the games. Uh, we had had the usual negotiations over a period of time. That I, actually, I used to pretend that I was negotiating in Italian lira so that I didn't panic at the thought of the uh, amounts that were involved. Anyway, the negotiations followed uh, a few weeks later by a formal signing of the contract to record the deal. The usual celebratory dinner and everyone had gone off to their respective sunsets. But a few weeks after the signing, the head of NBC Sports called me in, in my office in Montreal, said that he and a bunch of his ex executives needed an urgent meeting with me. I, I, I'd be delighted to meet, but since there's only one of me and a whole bunch of you, why don't I get the Dawn Patrol down to New York uh, the next day? And he said, no, uh, it's urgent, and they would come to Montreal that afternoon. So I said, that would be fine. Isn't, isn't access to a G5 wonderful? <laughs> In any event, they, when they arrived, I said, what, what, what's, what's the big deal here? What's so urgent that uh, so much talent uh, that ought to be making millions in New York was up here in Montreal on such short notice? Well, they said they'd been reviewing the contract that we had signed a few weeks ago and had found to their horror uh, that it appeared from the language which I think related to the, the revenue sharing on the, the owned and operated uh, portion of their network, um, that they were going to have to pay the IOC $60 million more than they had uh, anticipated and that they thought we'd agreed. Huh. I said, well, let me have a look at it. So they showed me the portion of the contract and sure enough, that's what it provided. I'm enough of a lawyer to know that you could have gone to court on the basis of that, that contract which had an entire agreement clause in it, meaning you can't introduce anything else, and have won. Uh, their high-priced lawyers and our high-priced lawyers had settled on the uh, contractual language and signed off on it uh, before the contract was executed. So you, you can imagine there were many long faces uh, across the table from me. But I said, the, uh, the deal as written in the contract was not the deal that we'd agreed upon. And it was clear that the lawyers had made a, a drafting mistake. And I certainly wasn't uh, going to try and take advantage of a drafting error in our relationship with a, a very good Olympic partner. We, we, it was settled in 15 minutes. So the moral of that, uh, which and, and I, sh I know that story has gone around uh, you know, through the networks, is, is that uh, our partners can rely on us to do what we promised to do and that we would be acting in good faith at, uh, at all times. Your business conduct uh, should be consistent rather than occasional and opportunistic. Uh, all of us, I'm sure, have had um, experience with organizations, people, and professionals uh, who, to put it at its most basic, we do not trust and who are not reliable. There are some clients for whom I'm not willing to act. Uh, and I don't, uh, not because uh, uh, you know, they can't afford to pay the, uh, the fees, but precisely because I don't trust them and I don't wish to be identified with them, nor to have my firm identified with them. As I say, and it, it has nothing to do with the size of the, of the client uh, or the ability to pay the fees. It's the matter of an ethical and moral choice I have as a professional uh, regarding those to whom I'm willing to provide services. Your reputation in the community is what they say about you when you're not present. What do they say about you? 
The flip side of this, of course, is that you should be willing to say the same thing to a person's face that you say behind his back. Never think that uh, people make no judgments about you based upon what you say about others. They may believe what you say, especially if it's negative. They may even share the same view, but they will remember where they heard it, and they will wonder what you say about them when they're not there. In my firm, uh, we often use a litmus test in cases where we're not certain about something we've been asked to do or an opinion that a client is seeking or a, an action or a negotiating tactic. There was one of the founders of our firm who was a, a consummate lawyer and gentleman held in universal respect that bordered on rev reverence. And I'll call him George. So whenever we were not sure, we would ask ourselves, what would George do? And it was just astonishing how the moral clouds would instantly uh, disappear. You know, what would your George do? The key in a lot of these things, uh, of course, is, is um, it's not so much that when you consider a problem, I mean, it happens in, in our business. If we consider an issue, we're, we're more than likely to get it right. Uh, where you get into trouble is if you fail to consider or you forget to consider a particular point. And uh, that is the, uh, uh, that, that's where you can get into uh, deep trouble. And so you've got to train yourself, uh, almost a part of your routine, to, to ask those questions. And when, if you get them, get the issue out in front of you, you'll probably get it right. But if you forget to do that, or, or deliberately don't do that, that's where trouble can begin. Let me say, just uh, to conclude, uh, that in the end, uh, a leader must have one essential quality, that of being able to decide. Now, decisions may not always be correct and probably will not always be correct, but the leader must be able to make those decisions. A good example of that was, uh, came in, in 1993 after a spate of violence that had left uh, more than 140 people dead over the previous week. Nelson Mandela admonished a crowd, admonished a crowd that demanded that he take a more militant stand against white South Africans. And he said to them, as long as I'm your leader, I'm going to tell you when you're wrong and I will congratulate you when you're right. He knew in the, uh, the words of Andre Malraux that the first duty of a leader is to make uh, him or herself be loved without courting love, to be loved without playing up to anyone, including him or herself. It doesn't matter whether you're running the government of Canada, General Electric, or a small community volunteer organization. The principles of leadership remain the same. Successful leaders, at whatever the level may be, must apply those principles or risk being ineffective. Thank you very much.